Now we start our evening with a symposium. Today, Dr. Jyoti Rohila Rana would be here honoring us with her knowledge. She's an associate professor in the Department of History of Art, Banaras Hindu University. She has done BFA from Delhi College of Art with specialization in painting. She then did her master's from National Museum Institute of History of Art, Conservation and Museumology, New Delhi in 2002. She worked on the sculptural art of Amravati. For her doctoral dissertation from National Museum Institute, New Delhi 2007 and published it in the book form. She has also contributed number of research papers dealing with her specialization on the Buddhist sculptural art and imageries and also on varied subjects. Dr. Rana has a teaching experience of 15 years in both UG and PG courses. She has taught various papers, early Indian art, outline of Western art, art of West Asia, heritage management, etc. I would now request Dr. Jyoti Rohilarana to please come up and share her knowledge with all of us. Namaskar, um, and a very good evening to all of you. It gives me immense pleasure to be here on stage, and not just on the stage, to be with the family of Anugunj, and for the second time, and it's been a wonderful experience because, you know, one, that it feels like a family. Two, that it gives so much of exposure to the young budding artists. And three, that uh, it gives an opportunity to uh, many people, many students, many young budding artists to come and experience and learn a lot of things from Anugunj. So uh, I want to thank Prashant Sarkar sir and uh, Kirti ma'am for having me here for the second time. And uh, so as you can see, uh, and as ma'am said that I've introduced a paper called Art and Environment. And that paper deals with, you know, the consciousness about environment. So I'll be starting with this slide and with this picture and I'll be ending with the same. And, uh, you know, with the concept that how should we take art, the new art, the new medium in today's perspective. And yesterday, uh, in yesterday's lecture by Pankaj Sharma, you also saw that there are mediums which can give trouble, which can be, you know, a little tricky to handle. So that's a different perspective that is from conservation point of view. But I am going to deal about it uh, from a different perspective as in about you know, environmental consciousness. So my lecture I've divided into kind of many parts and I'll be taking you through a very kind of different kind of journeys which I think you would enjoy and uh, the first part of it will deal with what is environmental consciousness. And uh, first, I'll be talking about the second part, that is environmental consciousness and why is it needed and what is the need of it in today's scenario. And then I'll be dealing with art, the whole journey of Indian art, how it came through. And three, that experimentation through the medium in contemporary art, when we talk about contemporary art, we see many artists, like they have been dealing with different mediums and uh, the mediums are very varied. So how the artist has to be very, very selective about choosing a particular medium. This is my perspective through which I'm seeing and there are many, many uh, critiques also who have commented upon it. So taking their view, you may agree or you may not agree, it will be there. But uh, I'm just going to put through my perspective through it. Then uh, there is a word called environmental art. So what is environmental art? In brief, I'll be talking about that. Some glimpses of uh, Western environmental art, because environmental consciousness initially started in the West in the 70s. So I'll be giving you that overview. 
And it started there because they are the ones who exploited the nature to a great extent you know, in the very beginning, and they are the ones who are first realizing the uh, relevance of it. So they started it, and then it came to India also. So then I'll be talking about certain Indian environmental artists, and in the end, I'll be, you know, putting forth an idea, um, you know, in front of you. Uh, it is up to you how you take it and how you ponder over it, what ideas you develop, what ideas you won't like. So that's up to you. Next slide, please. You know, I'll just get the slide fixed because the top part is getting cut. Uh, till the time it is going to be fixed. This, I guess many of you would be knowing which sculpture it is. It is Subodh Gupta's Dada. And it is a banyan tree which he, uh, you know, he created. Right now it is uh, installed in National Gallery of Modern Art Delhi. And as you can see, the medium used is steel. Right, so it's a very, uh, you know, um, you should take it this way, like I'm talking about environmental consciousness where nature is very important, but here nature is depicted in a very different way, which is appealing though, but what, where it is going to lead us, I'll be taking, dealing with it in the last slide. Next please. So uh, before uh, starting with it, I will be talking about what is environmental consciousness and why is it needed. So environmental consciousness is to be aware about your own environment and nearby surroundings and nature is very important in that. And what has happened is that there has been environmental crisis and as you can see, there has been global warming, overpopulation, hate, torture, nuclear proliferation, disease, famine, poverty, terrorism, pollution. I mean, it is uh, a real nightmare which we are going to face and we are facing right now. Next, please. So when we deal with these, uh, you know, issues, there are certain questions that come to our mind and I'll just go through it very fast, that what is the place of human beings in the natural world? Do human beings have responsibility to other species? Are humans being part of nature or they are apart from it? Is it the need of the art that human beings need to have control over their desires in order to save nature? So, one second. So the thing is that now we have to understand, like it is very high time that we have to know that whether we are part of nature or nature is part of us. So there is two way of seeing uh, it, but we have to see it from that perspective. Next, please. So environmental crisis, as I said, there are many. Next, please. And global warming is one of them. Next, please. Next. Uh, depletion of ozone layer. Next. Deforestation. Next. And because of it, the result is uh, the melting of the glaciers and rising of the sea level and the tsunamis, as you can see. like. You must be wondering why I'm dealing with this. It's because just to, you know, shake you around and let you know, like, these are the crises we are facing. And um, artists are the one who can make people aware uh, through their works of art that what are the things we have to, you know, do and what not. Next, please. Next, please. And if we don't realize it, then the result will be the drowning of Earth due to global warming and greenhouse effect. And by that time, nobody would be there to, you know, kind of realize 
what we, have, we had done, what wrong we had done in our past, it'll be all gone. It'll just go out of our hands, just like when you hold the sand very tight, it just flows away. Next, please. Next, please. Are there next? Next, please. So we talk about, now this is the second part, the role of art. Next. So I'll begin with, you know, I'll just take you briefly through the journey of Indian art where we go back to the prehistoric times. And what you see here is uh, the prehistoric drawing, the prehistoric rock paintings from Bhimbetka. And, you know, it is very important. I'll be highlighting the medium. And you would be analyzing it through, like, whether they were, you know, good enough in selecting the medium or they were bad enough in selecting the medium. This painting dates back to 3000 or maybe prior to that, 5000 BCE, right? And still they are intact. And they have not been painted on any sophisticated surface. They have been painted on rocks. So, and they are still surviving till now. So uh, I'll deal with it next. Next, please. This is uh, um, a bison from Altamira, and this date backs to 15,000 to 10,000 BC. And this again, you know, goes way back behind, and you can very well see the colors, they are still bright and, you know, nice. Next, please. Uh, that um, Altamira, I said I'll be talking about Indian art, but I just picked up Altamira because the colors were really bright and nice. Then talking about Ajanta paintings, because then after prehistoric period, there's a long gap where we don't find uh, any paintings. But it is Ajanta which comes up as a huge repertoire of paintings. And the kind of paintings, the kind of lines, the kind of, uh, you know, sophistication we find in Ajanta is something really amazing. That's a different... Uh, aspect, we can deal with it in length. But when we talk about the medium, the medium is tempera, it's done on wall, on the cave, on the cave surface, and they are still intact. Uh, if uh, any one of uh, you knew that they darkened, they got darkened, that was because of the wrong treatment given by the conservators. They, when varnish initially came, uh, they thought that, that it would act as a protective layer, but with time, it darkened the paintings from the surface, and later on, they were removed. They were removed, the, the varnish was removed. So till today, even now, I mean, these are fifth to seventh century, uh, you know, um, BC paintings, oh, sorry, CE paintings, but still they are intact. So why I'm highlighting the medium is like they used mineral colors, they used very rugged surfaces, did some treatment, but that too it was eco-friendly materials they used, and you can see the result, right? Next, please. These are the cave paintings of Bach. And they're very close to Ajanta, close to in terms of treatment, in terms of art, and in terms of uh, the selection of medium also. Next, please. These are Brihadeshwar Temple Tanjore, talking about South India. And same thing, same wall painting. Next, please. Then, uh, you know, in medieval period, long time we find the tradition of paintings that was done on the wall surfaces. But during the medieval period, as in when the Mughals came, along with them, the art of miniature painting came from Persia. And when it came from Persia, uh, it just brought a different medium, a different material, a different surface altogether. And that surface gave artists a new dimension of painting. And as you can see, even the colors, I mean, you must have seen an artist painting outside, he's doing work with stone colors, right? 
And these colors were also, they were also, you know, mineral colors, the stone colors, they were mixed together. Uh, the paper was used and it was like layers of paper fixed together by glue and it was burnished. And after burnishing, they would paint on the surface. And the result is this. So using paper, but not just plain paper, not just acid treated paper, but a very uh, good handmade paper with rough cellulose on it, and then making the vasli in a different way, and then painting on it with mineral colors or stone colors. So the result, and even today, when you see these paintings, they look as fresh as they were painted today. So if we are getting such kind of results, we really have to go back and sit back and think whether we are using the right material today or not. Next, please. Then miniature paintings, like when the Mughals uh, became weak, this tradition of painting was you know, uh, regionalized and it went to uh, the Pahari miniatures. This is one example, similar kind of painting, but themes became different. This is Basoli. Next, please. This is Guler. And as you can see, the, the treatment uh, of flora and fauna, how beautifully it has done. Next, please. And then, uh, these were the sophisticated arts, but when we talk about vernacular paintings, there are two which we can broadly classify. One was tribal painting and another is rural painting. And in tribal painting, we find Bheel, Worli, Gon, Santhal, Saura, Kurumba. And in rural, we find Patachitra, Madhubani, Kalamkari, Kolam, Kalam, and Mandana paintings. Next, please. So these are a few examples. And why I am highlighting these examples is that these artists were using the traditional way of painting and similar kind of motifs and similar kind of medium from the, I mean, it was very close to prehistoric rock paintings, but the surface was really treated in a different way. But the treatment was very, very similar. Next, please. This is worldly painting. And as you can see, the red color, this is red ochre and white is lime. And it's a very, very, uh, you know, very basic material, which you still find today, but nobody even bothers to use this material. Next, please. Uh, then we come to uh, post-independence India. So what happens is, you know, the themes, the motives, uh, the surfaces are being changed, but not the medium. The medium is very close. It's not being experimented to a great extent. So by the time of independence in, in 1947, several schools of art in India provided access to modern techniques and ideas. Galleries were established to showcase these artists. Modern Indian art typically shows the influence of Western styles, but is often inspired by Indian themes and images. And most importantly, they were experimenting with the forms and technique and not the medium so far. This is what I said. Next, please. So here you see, like this was a time when oil colors came uh, in the West. And it was Raja Ravi Verma who first experimented with these colors. You know, and what you can see is the result is right here. One second. So this is Raja Ravi Varma, and uh, uh, it was very close to photographic kind of imagery, which you see here, very realistic, very beautiful, very rich in colors. Next, please. Next, please. So this is uh, some other paintings. This is Bharat Mata, and this is another painting. Uh, during that time, during... Uh, you know, post pre and post independence, uh, the revival of uh, Indian art uh, because of uh, the British, they wanted to revive the Indian tradition of painting, so they brought back the same style. Next, please. 
Next, please. So the progressive artist group like was established shortly after India became independent in 1947 and was intended to establish new ways of expressing India in the post-colonial era. Its founder was Francis Newton Souza and S.H. Raza, M.F. Hussain and Manishi Day were early members and others included Akbar Padamse, Sadanand Bakre, Ram Kumar, Tayyab Mehta, K.H. Ara, H.A. Gare and Bal Chabra in 1950. V.S. Gaitonde, Krishan Khanna, and Mohan Samant also joined. So I have taken the names of these artists because I want to highlight again that these artists, I mean, if I deal with these artists, it is going to take a lot of time. But these artists contributed a lot, you know. Uh, they were dealing, they were experimenting with the forms, with the technique of oil painting only but were not uh, like the oil painting was the new thing, the new medium that was added. But today we realize even oil paintings has got its you know, uh, weak points. We'll talk about that later. But uh, uh, these were the artists, they were experimenting with the forms. Next, please. Uh, I can skip this slide, but you know, some of the artists, important artists, like I'll be talking about Vivan Sundaram because he came up as an installation artist and I'll be talking about installation art also. Next, please. Some of the acclaimed contemporary Indian artists include Nagaswami Ramachandran, Jitish Kalat, Atul Dodia, and Geeta Vadera. Next, please. Uh, as I said that I'll be talking about Vivan Sundaram and here you can see these are the installations by Vivan Sundaram and this is the time when the artists like they experiment, uh, they feel as if the whole world has been opened to them and they have all the freedom to experiment with any kind of medium. So here you see these are the mannequins, the body organs anatomy samples which are made of fiberglass garments, fabric, rubber, leather, iron, tin, marble, ceramic, paint, gum tip, wood. Till this time it was okay to use such kind of material because they were, you know, uh, in the market they were available and they were being used in a very limited uh, manner, not in, on a very large scale. Next please. And this, of course, I think many of you would be knowing. This is the bean, very popularly known as the bean in Chicago. And what you see here is, like now you would find the enormous mass of you know, material being used. This is 110 tons of polished stainless steel. Next, please. This is another stainless steel arch by Anish Kapoor. And these artists are very, very like very prominent artists of today because they are acquiring the market on a very you know high level right now. Next please. So uh, known for spectacular, spectacularizing the mundane and monumentalizing the banal to create a captivating, threatening and sublime work of art the Indian contemporary artist Subodh Gupta created the surreal banyan tree, which I showed you in the first slide, which stainless steel trunks and hanging roots, bears foliage and fruits in the form of stainless steel utensils, thereon lending a fresh perspective to art. Now, I mean, when I see this, uh, this is a quote by one of the uh, like art appreciation, uh, like a person who appreciates art. But do we really see a fresh perspective of art? In one go, yes, but there are many layers of, you know, um, ideas which we have to ponder upon. Gupta chooses signature objects of the subcontinent and morphs them as art objects in the form monumental installations of stainless steel and tiffin tins, which, uh, you know, which is very, uh, they say that they are using the rough things, they are using the, you know, they are reusing the things, but reusing as in they are accumulating it. They could have used it in, 
I'll talk about that in the next slide. Next, please. So here you see another work of Subodh Gupta. The huge amount of steel he has used. These are the two works. One is in, again in NGMA and the other one you can see the skull. Next, please. And then this work, this is line of control. So art, this artwork measures 36 feet and 36 feet and weighs 20 tons, uh, which makes it one of the largest public art installations. Very nice, this is very good, you know. But do we have enough spaces to install such kind of works, huge monumental works all around? A question to ponder upon. And the uh, line of control consists of Indian cooking utensils and a colossal mushroom cloud constructed entirely of pots and pans. Very creative, no doubt. But again, are we creating a line of control or are we going out of control? You know, I'm leaving you with this question. Next, please. Then, this is one journey through which I've taken you, you know, about Indian art, and then the next part comes. Go back, please. Uh, um, now I'll be talking about what is environmental art and land art. You know, it's a different, different perspective where I'll be showing you, like, people who want to uh, do art, be creative, can experiment with nature only, and can create monumental works of art. Next, please. So uh, the term environmental art often encompasses ecological concerns, but is not specific to them. The term environmental art is used in a variety of different contexts. It can be used to refer to art describing the natural world, which we saw uh, you know, in paintings like miniature paintings, in our prehistoric paintings, and other paintings also. And uh, art that celebrates personal engagement with the natural world and art in nature and to the practices of ecological artists whose works directly addresses environmental issues. Ecological art or eco art through educating people about the natural world or intervening in and restoring the natural world. So uh, ecological artist Aviva Rehmani believes that ecological art is an art practice often in collaboration with scientists city planners, architects, and others that result in a direct intervention with nature. So this is very, very different kind of art which doesn't involve the artist only. You know, it can be used, it can be worked upon when it comes to the beautification of a very desertified kind of an area where not just artists, I mean, artist of course would be there because he has, he or she has the aesthetic perspective of, uh, you know, treating a space in a very beautiful manner. But, you know, the city planners, uh, the architects, who would be helpful in creating that space into a beautiful world, you know? Next, please. I'm sorry, the slide is being cut from top and bottom also, so this is quite a problem. But this is a uh, very famous uh, work, Spiral Jetty. And um, as you can see, this is an aerial photograph where the artist has created a kind of, like this is a stream flowing, and the artist has created this spiral. You know, it's a kind of a, um, you know, hindrance that has been created by the artist. And as you can see, the water is flowing, it's creating ripples. So it's a very beautiful way of, you know, uh, creating a work of art, a monumental work of art. Next, please. This is another work. Uh, and this I'm showing you the works of the Western artists. Um, this is by A. Turner. And here you can see the pyramid, sphere, and a rectangle. And uh, has been used, like, is the wood which has been used is a uh, wood available from nature only. It has not been cut. It has not, it has just been collected and used and given a shape. Next, please. This is uh, another work, Finger Maze where you can see from, it is from the aerial view, here the artist has used a grass cutter and created a, this is a finger maze by Chris Drury. He has used stone and lime mortar and created this, you know, like if you see this fingerprint, uh, the thumb impression which you have on your finger, 
He has created that on the surface of the ground. Next, please. And this is how Chris Drury, uh, he mown grass. And this is in 2006 he created. So it's a, it is the finger maze, uh, a maze. Why he calls it finger maze is this is a thumb impression which you find, or thumb or finger impression. And that is what he has created just by cutting the grass in that pattern. Next, please. This is fingerprint mural, uh, and this is another way of dealing with such kind of work. You can see the thumb impression, the fingerprints, uh, the printouts. And in between, he has collected the grass. This is a different kind of installation where there is no harm to nature. It is the, you know, uh, the rough used material, which is not, you know, destroying the nature at all that has been used. Next, please. This is uh, Tabernas Desert Run by Simon Starling, Mixed Media 2004. And this is to say that like a cycle, a bicycle, which was very eco-friendly, can also be turned into uh, something like with a cylinder and everything just to make it more powerful. So it's a kind of a satire also. So artworks not just supports, but they can also give a satire to the society you know, where you really need to think about to, it really shakes you around, like, to think whether what we are doing is right or wrong. Next, please. Because we want to make everything very powerful and very fast. This is Icarus Palm by Douglas White, and this is called Discarded Tire. And uh, Discarded Tire, he has used this Icarus Palm, and this is again a satire that, you know, very soon, uh, you will be having such kind of trees only, the rubber trees. Next, please. So uh, this was one aspect where the artists were creating awareness towards, you know, environmental consciousness. They were uh, using eco-friendly materials. And then another thing is like sending the message to the society and when we talk about society, society means public. So the public art comes into existence. And how an artist has the capability to give the messages to the society in a very strong manner, but in a silent mode only. Next, please. Uh, this is very, very interesting work by uh, Henk Hofstra. In April 2007, Henk Hofstra created an urban river in Rachten, the ne Netherlands. The Blue Road installation is an example of what mind-blowing urban public art can do. Next, please. Now, this was a project, a public art project. And as I said, you know, it involves architects, the municipality, and everything, everybody coming together. So it is, what is urban river? It is it featuring 1,000 meters of road painted blue and the phrase, water is life. Do we really realize that water is life? So water is life, written in eight meter high letters across it. The blue road is reminiscent of the waterway that used to be where the road is now. So where the road is, there used to be a waterway and now it doesn't exist anymore. And slowly and slowly it's, you know, uh, going away from most of the places. So it's a memorial to nature, but it's also just plain awe-inspiring. There's even a few cool tidbits along the road, like a sinking car I'll show you just now. The project took 4,000 liters of paint and cost 75,000 euros. Half of the cost was covered by municipal funds. Hofstra wants the road to be visible on Google Earth, but it hasn't shown up yet. But some of the images are there. Next, please. So here you can see, I'm sorry, the left uh, photo is kind of blurred, but you can see how it was done and the road being painted blue. Next, please. This is how it looked. Next, please. And this is the sunken car, which they are showing, that if there was water, the car would have, you know, sunk in the water. Next, please. So very simple and low-cost urbanistic gesture to reinforce the street as a space and a place. So artists, I mean, you cannot be bounded to a very limited space also. You can be very, very expressive and very bold in your expression. Bold in the sense, a very strong message can be sent through 
your creativity to the mass, to the public. Because when we work in the galleries, very limited people come. But when you go to such public spaces, a lot of people can see it. And it is a very powerful way to give the message to the public on a large scale, as I said. Next, please. This is one search. Even the waste bin was turned blue. Next, please. And this is how it looked like from above. And uh, if there was water, it would have looked like a water stream, a blue stream like this. But unfortunately, now there's no water, and it looked like this. Next, please. Now, this is another, I mean, this is the second one which I've taken. Uh, this is called Insert Here Project by Yves Moshe. And as you can see, the such kind of arrows would be put, insert uh, a gap, a fill in the blank, and here. So it is up to you what exactly you want. Like, do you want, in, in this space, what is it that you want? So here it's lit, written green roof. Next, please. So insert here is an interactive public art project conceived by Eve Mosher. Interactive in the sense, it is not just a monologue, it's a dialogue. Dialogue between the artist and the public. So the project capitalizes on community awareness of plays and optimism around climate change solutions. So this was a project which concerned the climate change solutions. They were looking for solutions that what is it they want. So the project invites people to place bold yellow insert here arrows in locations in their community where they want to insert a climate change solution. And for example, I mean, anybody could write insert bike lane here because they want bikes, bikes as in bicycles, where only bicycle lane should be there so that people use more of bicycles. Insert community garden here where people can come and sit and relax in the lap of nature Insert solar panels here, because solar panels are eco-friendly. And insert trees here. By placing these arrows along, people's daily migratory paths, individuals, and groups can share their proposed solutions with the greater community. Next, please. So these are a few uh, examples, like bike lane, you can see. You can see local organic farmer stand. So people are becoming aware, and they want you know, organic things also. So they are louding their voices. Next, please. Community garden, instead of a petrol, they don't want a petrol pump, a uh, yeah, fuel station. They want a garden here. Next, please. They want a park here. Next, please. And the last, uh, just um, a last project, which says The Invisible Man by Liu Bolin. The, it's a project which relates to China, which consumes more coal than any other country in the world, using it for everything from electricity and producing steel to deadly indoor heating and cooking in some rural areas too. With their unregulated mines, China's coal mines are also fatal and thousands of people a year die due to explosions, cave-ins, and other disasters. Coal pile is a conceptual sim commentary on the consequences of not only the dependence on coal, a limited resource. We don't realize it's a limited re resource. We think it's unlimited, but we just use it, you know? So, but the dangers that come for families who work with and use coal, ironically, to survive. Next, please. So here you see, I mean, you just see a coal pile, but there's a man also standing in front. And how many men like this die in these cave inns, in, in some, some accidents or, we don't know. And we are using coal for our use. So these, these were the three projects which I thought, you know, uh, would give you an insight about public art and how it should be dealt upon. Next, please. Environmental art in India, there are some artists who are like coming up with such kind of projects. Next, please. This one of them is Ravi Agrawal. He is an environmentalist. He holds an NGO, and he has done a project on Yamuna River. And I think people who live in Delhi, they know that Yamuna, at one point of time, used to be a very fine river. But now it has turned into a black, dark, you know, nala uh, with no uh, blue waters, you know. 
So um, he has done a lot of work. Um, Unfortunately, I mean, I'll see if the time permits, I can show you a video. If not, there is a video by uh, him, I can give you the link, where he shows about his works, how he has dealt with the project, you know, to, uh, like, in an artistic manner only. And he has just not shown the dark side of Yamuna River, but also the brighter side of it, that every side, every, uh, every bad thing has two sides of a coin, a good and bad both. So he has tried to show both. Next, please. Next, please. This is uh, Nalpar structure, Kopwara by Navjot Altaf. This is another way, I mean, I am going to criticize steel uh, in one manner, but here it is good because, you know, it is kind of making the space where the hand pump is neat and clean for the villagers to use. And, um, you know, on, on the walls of it, you can see the, uh, the impression of hand pump only. So this is Navjot Altaf, uh, who has worked on this aspect. Next, please. This is another artist, I mean, again, a satire that, uh, you know, very soon will not be having pure drinking water. And because of global warming, all the water from, since India is a like a place where perennial rivers flow, but if the global warming place and all the glaciers melt, all the water is going to end up into sea. And here what you see is like, although there is water, but there is no drinkable water. So it's a satire to the society and you would be, you know, uh, striving for water at one point of time. So such kind of messages, I mean, to create awareness amongst people can be sent through these works of art. Next, please. Next, please. So uh, this brings me to the end of the presentation. And uh, I think I've given you enough food of thought, like what kind of materials to be used and how we can be a little selective about material thinking about, of course, about the longevity of works of art, because many artists want their works to live longer so that there would be generations to see uh, your works of art. But at the same time, we need to be conscious about our environment also. So when we talk about Subodh Gupta's banyan tree, um, certain questions again, how many trees and how much of natural resource do we need to create this impression of environment? Because as you know, if we need steel, we need to dig out mines, you know? And for digging out mines, a uh, lot of deforestation would be done, you know? And in the end, what are we ending up with? A banyan tree like this, made of steel? Is it worth? Then um, it could have been replaced by a real banyan tree so that we could have some clean air and the ecological damage from this work can be compensated over maybe two decades. There are people who are working, like real banyan tree as in, we could have created such kind of, uh, you know, landscape with the help of artists where the trees would have been a very kind of beautiful garden we would have had and which would have benefited, benefited not just us, but our future generations. Because our future generations would be asking us that why did we do such mistakes and we would be left with no answers. And uh, in the end, as an ecologically aware and sensitive society, we need to be very careful of what we support and promote. This is very important, that we need to be very careful of what we support and promote, else our future generations will have trees like this to get the impression of nature. Thank you very much.